All right, guys. This week's question, if you'd be so kind, is how does socialism differ from communism? This is such a good question, but also I think a very difficult question. We might end up going in very different directions with this, which I think is okay. Okay. Did you want to start or I can start? I can start. Okay. Well, I think it's really difficult because, first of all, lots of people use them as synonyms. Mm -hmm. I don't actually get that upset if people do use them as synonyms because Marx often did. So the idea that people treat them as the same thing, I think, is okay. That said, if we want to talk about a distinction between them, then then let's go ahead and make a distinction. And that distinction I would make as as this one, which is kind of the old school. This is like the standard socialist Marxist standard answer. And that is that socialism, and, and I might explain it a little bit differently than the standard, but I think this is not too far off the beaten path. Socialism looks essentially one economic transformation ahead, whereas communism looks two economic transformations ahead. So socialism would be an economy where people are reimbursed for wage labor, but puts a lot more control into the workers' hands, where you may not necessarily have a distinction between workers and owners. So there's still wage labor, there's still a money economy, but it can be planned and it can be owned and operated by workers. Communism, I would say, is the look to the next step after that. So there's no way that we can even really start to imagine communism in any meaningful way until we've achieved socialism but communism is saying okay well knowing that no economic system is ever the end all be all Mm -hmm. what is the next step after that which would be an economy that has abolished money and is able to coordinate things in a way where all of the different games that come about with money, like trying to eke more money out of this or whatever, all of the kind of funny business that happens out of that doesn't matter anymore because we found a way to organize all of the needs of society as well as all of the enriching, self-fulfilling you know, the the Maslow's hierarchy of needs all the way up to what's the top of it, the self-actualization, yep. where we've managed to coordinate not just the needs of society, but also all of the desires of society up to self-actualizing individuals in such a way that we don't need money, and in fact, it would just be a burden on, on achieving those things. So... Granted, that's a really rosy picture. That's mm. not something that I'm saying that that we can achieve, but I think that that's where we're going to have to start looking next once we've achieved a a fair and equitable society. I mean, I think that's really the first step we need to do, because right now we do still have a ruling class. So in the capitalist economy, we have owners and we have workers, and there are clearly people that make the decisions and pull the strings and and have vast amounts of power greater than greater than everyone else and that's the major problem right now so first step make an equitable society second step after that then and this this is you know hundreds and hundreds of years in the future is to figure out okay now that we have an equitable society How can we structure this in a way where we can abolish money and all of the games that come with money management to meet the needs, desires, and and higher level actualization of our citizens? Are there modern day communist parties? I mean, I don't hear about them as much as socialist parties. Yeah, oh, yeah, see, that's the other thing, is that I feel like there's a different distinction that people make. Okay. For many people, socialism and communism mean two different things, and this is what they mean. 
and I think this is popular in the U.S. and I don't know, maybe in Western Europe. I'm not sure. They have socialist parties, but for many people, socialism means the nice ones. It's it's <laughs> the people that want to reform society for the needs of of the common citizenry and the working class. Mm-hmm. And for those people that view socialism as that, the definition of socialism isn't really different there than what I have said earlier. Except for sometimes those people view what we would call social democracy as socialism. In other words, having better funded public schools or having a food stamps program or, you know, these are not things that transform society in the sense of putting the power in the hands of the working class. They just make society more equitable. The Obama is a socialist socialism. Yeah, exactly. Some people view, even people that call themselves socialists, like you said, as well as people who attack socialism, many of them view socialism as government transfers of wealth Mm -hmm. where we we have taxation and then that those taxes are used to support people who need help i like those things and i'm a socialist but those things aren't socialism socialism is when you take the actual control and put it in the hands of the working class that's what what socialism is, and it, I think it's way too often conflated with things that are there to help the working class, but don't actually put control in in their hands. I mean, anyone who is a socialist most likely supports those things. Mm-hmm. If you're a socialist and you want control in the hands of the working class, you're probably happy that whenever the working class gets relief of any kind, whether or not it puts control in their hands. But I think you're missing the mark if you call it socialism without putting the control in in, in the right spot. That said... Sometimes communism, that's the other part I haven't talked about, sometimes communism, instead of being painted, as I said, a belief in two steps down the line in social transformation, sometimes people define communism as what happened in the Soviet Union. They define communism as Stalinism, and they define communism as what happened in China, basically an authoritarian form of government control with a police state and all the rest of it because those places have called their parties communist parties. And so it makes sense in a certain mindset to call that communism. And and uh, I, I feel like that's largely an issue of branding. Mm-hmm. I would take the stance that they have taken a very popular term realizing the popularity of it because of the image it presents, communism being the transformation of society in an equitable way to fulfill all individuals. They've taken that idea and said, yes, we are a party for that in order to gain support of the population or votes or whatever it might be. But then those parties have not lived up to that. So the the question is, okay, so is communism something they were pretending to be, which I say it is, or is communism what they actually were? Well, then what's the term for the thing they were pretending to be? Then we don't have a term for that. So mm-hmm. I think that causes confusion. I tend to say communism is that idea that that was out there and those parties were just manipulators of that term yeah see i i think i like that you said it, the idea of communism because i normally call myself just a socialist and i define it very much in the exact same terms as you do i think it's interesting that uh zizek growing up in ussr uh or in soviet yugoslavia talks about the communist idea or ideal and he defines it as the the traditional definition of communism. But, I mean, if you talk about it like that, then I would call myself a communist and not a socialist. And so I think it gets tricky because it depends. If somebody wants to know if I'm a communist or a socialist, it depends on how they think of the terms. You know, what do you think of when you hear socialism or communism? Because if you understand it the way I understand it, I don't care which one you call it because you understand that it's complex and and different 
But I think it's interesting that somebody growing up under a quote unquote communist regime mm-hmm. still uses that term of communism. One of the most interesting things to me about the question of what does communism versus socialism mean is I think this question grows largely out of McCarthyism, mm. at least when anyone from the U.S. asked the question, because McCarthyism started out with demonizing communists yeah. and calling them foreign agents, although many of them were U.S. citizens, had never been to Russia, had no ties with Russia. They may, many of them were from Europe, because that's where many of the, the settlers of America came from. Mm. But the fact of the matter is that they painted all of them as the enemy within. And that was a very successful campaign. They did that very well. So well, in fact, that they basically won and they moved to the next step where they thought, okay, who's the next in line? And they said, we're going to take everyone that calls themselves a socialist and say that those people are really just communist and there's no difference. The only difference is that the word is is pronounced differently. (laughs) And so that is a legacy of McCarthyism. And it was so successful enough that even now, here we sit, me and Tony both identifying as socialists and acknowledging, yeah, there are so many different definitions out there that it makes it really hard to talk about this question because people mean different things yeah. when they say it. And I, I think that's largely because if imagine a world where McCarthyism did not happen where communism and socialism were not rejected, we would have large communist and socialist parties in the United States. They probably wouldn't be the top two parties. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But assuming that they aren't, even if they existed, people would know the difference between them in the same sense that, well, I mean, these terms get fraught with questions as well, but People generally don't say, what's the difference between a feminist and an environmentalist? People might argue over the specifics of those two definitions of what a feminist is or what what an environmentalist is, but they don't confuse those two. But I think that's largely because they haven't been destroyed in the same way that, that communists and socialists have because of McCarthyism. And so we we have rebuilding that needs to be done in those areas. If there is a socialist party in the country and there's a communist party, you can point to those and say, okay, the socialists are for this and the communists are for this. But when those parties are decimated, like, yeah, we technically have a communist party here and we technically have several socialist parties, but they've been decimated so much that People don't know what their platforms are. But if they did, if those parties were there and able to run ads or participate in debates, if they had a platform to communicate their ideas to people, then people would know what they stood for and no differences between them. I think there also starts to be confusion on the left with Marx himself used both terms how I've heard it explained is that in order to differentiate himself from the utopian socialists like Owen and stuff, he called his more scientific socialism Mm -hmm. communism. And then Lenin, likewise, confuses things in that he, partially going off the definitions you gave, but also because of his disgust with the socialist parties in Europe voting for going to war, war in World War I, mm-hmm. decided that he was a communist and that his party should be communist. So it's been very fluid just in terminology in the past. And I think, too, in the present, even just communist or socialist gets very confusing when with all the subdivisions within, whether it's... Maoist or Trotskyist or Marxist. I don't think you could generally say what is is a Marxist, a socialist, or a communist. Like oh, yeah, yeah, as silly exactly. as that may sound to anybody else, and I don't even know if I could generalize about any of them other than being like some people see Mao as a more central figure, and others Lenin, and others Marx. But it's 
Yeah, it's yeah. weird. I mean, any I feel like any answer about the definition of any of the terms used as categories on the left almost always is a discussion of the history of the term. Yeah. Because because they've been used in so many different ways by so many different people. And part of the future of those terms is the discussion of who we who identify by those terms want to take as our champions and expel as our traitors, which is always an interesting discussion on the left. Like a very easy one for us is to, to label Stalin as a traitor. Yeah. So, so we get to expel him, but then, you know, who do we keep as our heroes? You know, many, many find Marx to be a good hero, but then there's the question of Lenin who seems to, be you know kind of in the middle or or if you don't think lenin's in the middle then maybe you think trotsky's in the middle yeah. or know. che yeah that one uh fidel yep and and maybe it's not a question and then and then another thing is to say okay it's not a question of people because people are always flawed people always have you know benefits and, and negatives but maybe it's a question of principles so what principles or what ideas really make up socialism or communism, and what organizational structures have been more important. That's a whole possibility as well. Yeah. I just, it's always sad to me, though, to see on the far left the, the people who really identify and then separate themselves from the other groups. I'm sure anybody listening to this knows there's a huge amount of just fracture on the left. It's pretty ridiculous how there are so many groups who strive for basically the same thing with some theoretical differences here and there. But by and large, everyone's working towards the same egalitarian society but can't get past these small little bits of doctrine. It's mm-hmm. it's kind of maddening. It's, it's where all these terms, it would be sort of nice if they'd all just go away and die. And then if people could talk, at, like you said, more about ideas. Do you think the labels are limiting in the sense that what, once you have a, a, a name for a thing and it has uh, characteristics, then you kind of have to hold on to those characteristics? You, you don't have the freedom of thought as much as you did before? What you have, you at one point had to say, these are what we stand for and this is who we are. We're X party. And as time changes, there's a little bit of a push because you're bringing people in with that name. There's a little bit of a push not to change as much or not to, to criticize or be skeptical of the things you thought were fundamental properties before. And so like these little differences become really big because that was what that was why we had our name. So we can't let go of this one little thing is that a part of it i i think it's it's more uh, the way i would phrase it is the old phrase the enemy of good enough is perfect and i think that's what's happened more and more and more on the left is the you find something that you agree with 95 percent, but the five percent difference and the right is really good about this. They find people that basically don't agree on anything and somehow corral them in the same party. Like people that are just really into Christianity. They somehow have in the same party as a bunch of atheistic millionaires who all they care about is making sure their tax rate is low. Like these people have nothing in common and somehow the right has corralled them into the same party. That and then and then like people that really like guns is a third one. And so they get all these people that have like basically nothing in common that are all in the same party. Where the left is the exact opposite, where we find people that agree with us ninety five percent and then we find this five percent and we're like, Oh no, this will not stand. I'm coming up I'm calling myself a Luxembourgian <laughs> or or whatever, because I believe in the Rosa Luxemburg's slightly different take on things, so I won't call myself a Marx, or I'll call myself a Trotskyist, because, you know, the, Lenin was close, but not quite there, it's, it's got to be Leon Trotsky, or whatever, you know, it's like, we've splintered so much, because we have let perfect be the enemy of, I'm not sure good enough is quite the right word that makes me think of democrats <laughs> but, but uh, you know what i mean it's it's we've 
tried to make things so pure that we've created this problem of fracturing into all these different groups. I remember being at a, at a progressive festival not a few months ago, and there was a guy that really wanted to talk about economic theory, but he he was really into, you know, like he had his list of people that he thought were good, and he was like, what theories do you guys believe in like tell give me some names and he had to like cross-reference if he had a on physical list. list yeah he had it on a like a <laughs> it was like a business card <laughs> except for the business card was a list of about 20 different names of a, like economic theorists that were like his approved people or like his people that he believed in which is fine i mean you got to have people you believe in but it was really interesting that he printed them out on a card that he could hand to people and and it was i mean honestly it, there were good things about it because he could hand me the card circle some names he's like oh i think you would like these and it, that was nice that he did that but at the same time he had all these different names that he like he was like oh this person is a marxist versus this person is a socialist versus this person is a communist the endless taxonomy of all of these and in this very recording we've talked about how these definitions have shifted and changed and the exact same theories can be called all these different things which can be really frustrating I, th I think it leads to the, the fracturing of really what is the revolutionary left, the anti-capitalist left, I, is the most inclusive way I can say I was going to say, I like revolutionary left. We should make a revolutionary left party, and then I immediately went, people aren't going to be okay with that. <laughs> they're going to want to know what the definition of revolution is, and then they're going to get all bogged down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the... the <laughs> The, yeah, the best way I can say it is the anti-capitalist left. What in your minds, then, is is uh, a solution? Because this seems like an algebra that has to be done for every party. There's a balancing act, because the bigger your party is, the more effective you can be, the more powerful you can be, because you have more people and more resources. But probably the bigger your party is that you're a part of, the, the, it, the size gets bigger, the amount that you agree with it, the percentage is going to go down. You were talking about 95%. You know, like, if a party gets really big, maybe you'll be down to 70%, but that 70% has a higher chance of getting implemented in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is like, what are maybe solutions for socialism, for, for fractured left in general? I would say that it's exactly focusing on the 95%, honestly, at least at this point, because I can argue over dogma, little bits of theory here and there, but that's an exercise for after we've established socialism. Once we work on sweeping out capitalism and work towards actual implementation of socialism, that's the time to have the discussion over these little bits of difference when it becomes practical that they're going to be implemented. It's so a little bit of car before the horse. Yeah, with that's, that's in my mind is that people just need to realize, I don't want capitalism, you don't want capitalism. We basically want the same thing. We need to join together to work for that thing, mm -hmm. and then let's hash out the differences try stuff, see what actually can work and does work, and go with those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to provide the exact same answer, but it's said in a different way, which is, I would say, the important part is that we are all people that don't believe in capitalism, capitalism being defined as the employer-employee relationship, and then all of the structure that goes around supporting that. And we believe in a new structure that will empower the regular citizen and regular worker in the workplace. I think that's the baseline. And if you don't agree with that, then that's fine. You probably actually should be a different party. And if you do agree with that, then we should all band together and, and be able to focus our resources and act as one. I think that is the baseline that should come together. And so I don't know what percent that is, if it's 95% or 70% or whatever. But to me, that is the right stance, and that's where we need to get. And like Tony said, if that means that we disagree on tiny things that need to be figured out after we've agreed, okay, we need to change this thing, that's fine. 
You could even disagree on sizable things, but they, the, if they just come after the capitalism, that's what matters. Yeah. That's the first step for uh, most of these parties, then that's what matters, yeah. Yeah. And, and so if you are brought to the table because you're motivated by a religious concern, where you believe you have a religious obligation to your fellow man, that's great. Or if you're brought to the table because of a logical concern for the collapse of society because you believe capitalism's internal contradictions will throw it into greater and greater catastrophes, that's great too. The fact that you arrive at it from different angles, to me that still means we can work together. There's tons of different distinctions we can come up with uh, amongst socialists and, and communists and Marxists and so on. But I think the baseline needs to be we don't believe in a a capitalist structure that puts the power in the employing class, which is an extremely small minority. And we instead believe in a society that empowers workers and citizens. And if you want to call it socialism or communism or Marxism, I mean, the, the word at that point really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm happy with any of them. But I, I think that is, is the crux. Labels yeah. are useful as an organizational tool. They help you uh, er, er, to identify a group. But once they get to the point where they are restricting uh, cooperation, uh, that's a time we need to reevaluate their usefulness. Yeah. yeah. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Okay, that's good. Okay.